Um, so this is the first time I'm doing the interview, so... Uh, um, I'll be patient. <laughs> um, well, if you don't mind, I'll start with personal questions. And the first would be, you have an interesting background of um, having a computer science diploma and uh, an improvisational comedy experience, which is different from stand-up comedy, I understand. It's different, yeah. Um, stand-up is, you know, you get up and tell jokes, and uh, improvisational comedy is you go out on stage without having any idea what you're going to say, much as I'm doing right now, and, you know, you react to audience suggestions. And can you just give a little bit of a background how you went from computer science to comedy and then back? Yeah, so I had a computer science degree from Michigan, and I was studying theater when I was at Michigan. Um, and uh, as I was getting ready to graduate, I just decided that I didn't want to dive right into computer science and wanted to, wanted to uh, uh, do comedy for a while. So I moved to Chicago, where there's a very famous um, improvisational theater uh, group called Second City. And I was uh, training with them for many years, and then went over to another improvisational uh, comedy theater in Chicago. And eventually, I had some auditions for television and didn't get them, and then went back into technology. <laughs> so what, what, what brought you? So the CEO of Twitter is kind of a fallback for me. <laughs> And, uh, and can you just tell us a little bit how you got back to internet and how you started there? Yeah, so I, was, I, I had a, a tech job that I'd interviewed for and gotten and had been working at for a while and saw the internet start to take off in 93. And I was, um, I guess I was surprised by the speed with which I saw things happening on the internet and the ease with which you could create uh, powerful technology on the internet and immediately decided um, that I needed to drop what I was doing and, and get involved in that space. So I did. I, I quit my job and started my first, uh, my first company, which was a, um, essentially a, um, a digital media um, consultancy. We built websites for people um, and uh, have been with it ever since. You know, I've just been, I've been, I've continued to be impressed year after year by the speed with which digital media changes people's lives and it and it and it again like i say every year it kind of it, it kind of continues to impress me and then the the feed burner 2004 uh, sold to google 2007 yes. can you tell, tell this story yeah so we decided when we created feed burner to um that the um the future of media was going to be distributed. And at the time, um, that distribution technology was, were, was RSS, um, RSS feeds. And as we thought about distributed media, our, our hypothesis about that was that it was going to be harder and harder for publishers to keep track of uh, everywhere their media was being distributed and harder for them to count it. And therefore, uh, if it's hard to keep track of and count, it's harder to monetize. So we created this technology called FeedBurner, um, whose goal was to act as a publisher clearinghouse for distributed media. Um, again, the hypothesis being, uh, we, FeedBurner, will distribute your media for you um, and count it for you and count sort of um, you know, syndication, distribution and syndication. And as a function of doing that, we'll be in the best position to monetize it for you. So we did that, and ultimately Google decided that if the future of media is distributed, and that's how media is monetized, they needed to be a participant in that. And um, how, was, how was Google? Google's an amazing company. Um, I learned many things from Google. You know, one of the um, things I was telling an entrepreneur yesterday is, if you create one company and it's successful and then you go to do something else, you have this real success bias. You know, you tend to think, well, this is the way to do it because that's the thing I did that worked before. And having created a few different companies, um, one of the things I've learned is that, uh, that you never fight the same battle twice. There are lots of different ways to do things. Um, so going into Google, I was very much in a, um, had a, had a state of mind of, this is a powerful and impressive company, and they've been able to do a lot very quickly, and I should pay careful attention to how they do things. Um, and there are lots of things that Google does um, very well and uniquely. Um, one of them is, for example, the way they do performance reviews. So paid careful attention to that and thought that the way that they did performance reviews was um, compelling 
It was heavily based on peer feedback, not just within a group, but across groups. That encourages lots of cross-team uh, uh, help. Um, one of the things you traditionally see in technology organizations that is that functions work well within a function, but there's not a lot of cross-functional help. Um, and Google did a great job of that by formalizing the reviews for it. So, uh, you know, I learned a ton there. Um, I worked for Susan Wojcicki who runs their ads group, and uh, she's just an impressive operator, um, super high bandwidth and very level-headed and calm, and I learned a lot from her, too. Is it really as distributed as many people say? The company, yeah. Google? Yeah, it is. Um, it's very entrepreneurial. Um, there's a lot of engineering-led innovation, which, which I think is super important. So one of the things we're trying to do at Twitter is build this sort of um, framework for entrepreneurialism. You know, we've bought a bunch of small companies lately, for example, and one of the things you want to make sure you do when you have founders and small teams coming into a company is it's, a, it's an interesting balance. You have to make sure that they don't go left when the company is going right, but you want to provide a framework within which they can remain entrepreneurial and uh, and, 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 and still head in the same direction as the company. So that's something we work on a lot. And talk about founders. When you joined uh, Google, you know, there was a professional CEO and then founders sort of reporting to him. Um, so how, how this was working out at that time? Well, I think, you know, uh, the evidence speaks for itself that Eric did a great job for many, many years. Um, I think that it's a, you know, it's a funny thing. Um, these things go in waves. Right now, there's a wave of, um, certainly a wave of founder CEOs, and, and Steve uh, Jobs was chief, chief among them. Um, there was a time not too long ago, you know, when you had Tim Kugel running Yahoo and, 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 and a, a, a bunch of folks like that, where there were a lot more, and Meg Whitman running eBay, where there were a lot more uh, professional, if you will, CEOs. I think these things come in waves. Um, the interesting thing about, um, about having founders involved in the company is, you know, so Jack Dorsey um, is the chairman, but he's the executive chairman at Twitter and, and involved in the company every day. It's helpful to have the inventor of the product speak about the product to people working on the product, right? He speaks, as, I, as, I, as I've said before, he speaks with the fluency of the inventor of the product, and it's an, it's an authoritative voice. Would it be like... Um similar arrangement, you know, similar to what you saw in Google, or slightly so different? I think everything is different, you know. Um, all these sorts of relationships are slightly different. I mean, there's Eric had worked with Larry and Sergey one way. I think that Mark and Cheryl worked together another way, and I'm sure Jack and I worked together a, a third way. Um, Jack and I have the benefit of, we're both engineers by, by trade, we're both computer science guys by trade, um, and we're and programmed for many, many years, um, but both have this deep interest in the arts, um, he in design, me in theater and, and fiction. Um, so we, we're deeply in sync and we communicate with each other all the time. Um, one of the things we do that I, I, I've actually, it's not my invention, I've picked up from some of the other folks I talked about, is we spend um, an hour together at the beginning of the week on Monday and an hour together at the end of the week on Friday just to make sure we're constantly in sync and, and thinking about things the same way and, and so forth. And uh, leaving Google and joining Twitter, how did that happen? So I left Google in July of, of 2009. I had, I, I had an obligation to Google after the feed burner acquisition and, and I fulfilled that. And I had every intention of um, taking a few months off and starting another company. And about two weeks later, I got a direct message from Ev um, uh, asking me, I guess it was maybe two, three weeks later, I got a DM from Ev asking if I would, um, uh, could, could help out with the company. Specifically, he was getting ready to um, have his first child and wanted to be able to take a couple weeks to spend some time with the child. And Twitter was only like 40 people at the time and wanted to know if I could, would come in and, and help out. Um, those conversations progressed and then uh, I remember having a conversation with my wife where I was still saying, listen, I, I want to take a couple months off here and start the next thing. And we talked about Twitter and, and we, we, I don't remember who it, it first said it, but we both kind of concluded that um, it had the potential to be one of these seminal 
digital media companies. And there are probably only as many as you can count on two hands ever. Um, and that, you know, I wasn't going to get asked to join the next one a month, a month later. So uh, we talked about it. It was a short, it was, ended up being a short and one-time conversation and decided that I, I, I had to take the opportunity. So I only ended up, only ended up taking about two weeks off. <laughs> and... Um yeah, and just talking about Twitter, you uh, you mentioned once that it's uh, it's like a world in your pocket. What do you, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I said uh, we want Twitter to be the world in your pocket. Um, what I mean by that is, so so I'll give you I'll, I'll tell this quick story. So I was on a, I was I was I was going to this conference that was overseas about a year ago. Not this one, another one. So it was a commercial flight that flying over the ocean had no Wi-Fi and no connectivity. So when you landed, you know, you pulled out your phone and, and checked things. So it was at dinner the first night of the conference, and there were about nine of us at the dinner table, and I asked everybody, again, this is almost exactly one year ago, I asked everybody, what did you check when you, when you landed? And about three of the people at the table said, well, I had text messages, so I, you know, I checked those. And a couple peop two people at the table each said one uh, independent and different thing. And then four people at the table said, well, I, checked, I pulled out Twitter to see what was going on. And what I mean by we want Twitter to be the world in your pocket is I want all nine of those people to say, well, I checked Twitter. Um, because we want Twitter to be the instant way of coming up to speed on what's happening in the world and what's happening in your world. And we want those to thread together seamlessly. So assuming that <coughs> there's this explosion of information, you know, when, you know, in a day you would have the amount of information created similar to, you know, the last hundred years, um, what, what, do you think, what do you see the role of Twitter there? Yeah, so significant, of course. Um, I'll tell a, a couple... Maybe I'll speak generally about what I see the role of Twitter there as, and then, um, and then specifically give a couple examples. Um, one of the things, I gave this keynote speech at Mobile World Congress in February to all the mobile operators in the world, and I said the fascinating thing about Twitter to me is that um, it's reducing the distance between people. And I think people kind of looked at me and thought like, well, of course, I mean, the internet, you know, has always shortened the distance between people and it allows you to communicate with people in Nigeria or wherever. And that's not what I meant. What I meant by Twitter reduces the distance between people is not just the physical geographic separation between people, but all these artificial barriers that exist between people. Um, some of them are based on status. Um, celebrity and non-celebrity, athlete and non-athlete, politician, citizen, et cetera. And they're, they're innumerable. And the thing that Twitter does, you know, and those erect these barriers and, these, and, the, and they make it hard to see around and see these other people. And I think what Twitter does is it flattens the landscape and shortens the distance between us so that we can see each other. And there are profound social implications for that, you know, on t specifically um, things like um, the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, who will happily reply to anyone who tweets him here today, um, you know, and good luck otherwise having a conversation with the president of Rwanda. Um, it's, um, it's things like, um, well, this guy who works for us, his mom has this independent bookstore. And in 2008, during the recession, she has a small bookstore in Portland, Oregon, in the US. And during the recession in 2008, she thought she was going to go out of business during the holiday season. And he just sent out a single tweet that said, my mom's independent bookstore that she's had for you know, so long is in real trouble. If you go there and buy a book, I'll buy you a burrito. <laughs> and. Uh, and whether it was you know, the word burrito or the impassioned plea, um, she had the best holiday season she'd ever had at her bookstore. So I think um, as more and more information pours into the network and everybody has a voice, uh, there will be you know, amazing implications, both social, educational, and technological for reducing the distance between people. And um, I understand that there are a lot of people in, in the audience related to advertising, um, assuming that Google 
did something very innovative and then Facebook. Yeah. Do you think that Twitter has that potential to redefine advertising? I do. Um, so I'll, I'll talk, um, yes I do. So I think the challenge with traditional digital advertising has been that the engagement rates are, are so poor. Um, now before digital advertising you could argue that it was hard to measure engagement rates at all, so at least now they're measurable and we know they're poor, so that's a, an improvement. Um, but, you know, when you've got these traditional uh, digital media advertising engagement rates that are 0 0.05 or 0 0.07, um, and people become used to that, I think that's not okay. So, um, our ad network and our, and our ads platform, the engagement rates are orders of magnitude higher than that, um, and that's fantastic. But I don't think that we or the indus industry should be happy with just that. We should keep on working on understanding the ways in which we can get engagement rates even higher on, on, on digital advertising. I think that will be, the, that's, the real, uh, that's the real tipping point for the, for, for the industry. So I know you've been uh, in Europe for a few days. Uh, what brings you here? You bring me here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we opened our, we, uh, we opened a London office. We, we, we're headquartered in San Francisco. We've opened two other international offices. Um, we have a London office where we have, where we have sales and engineering. Um, and we have a, a Tokyo office uh, where we just have sales and marketing right now. Um, the interesting thing about Europe for us is uh, the UK is one of our top growth and top active user countries in the world. Um, we're growing incredibly fast in Spain right now, and we're starting to really hit this. You know, we see these interesting inflection points in countries, and the shape of the curve generally looks the same, so we can tell when a country is starting to take off, or really take off. You know, there, I guess there are multiple inflection points. Um, and Spain has taken off. France and Italy are starting to hit this next uh, point in the curve. And so I wanted to be over here and really understand the landscape a little bit better and, and uh, just make sure we're being thoughtful about in investing appropriately in the area. Is there anything special about the southern Europe as opposed to... I don't, you know, it's a funny thing. I don't think there's anything special about a particular geography anywhere in the world. In Asia, for example, we're, we're quite strong in Japan and, grow, and we've started to tip and hit the inflection point in Korea and Indonesia and in other countries it's, it's earlier and it doesn't seem to be based on anything about the geography or the size of the country. And uh, talking about geography and, and, and global reach, um, is, it, um, is it a challenge for you to manage this expansion globally? Well, sh sure. Um, I think one of the, you know, I'll just dive into a, a business detail for the moment. One of the challenges when you're expanding globally is you have to start thinking about whether you're going to manage your organization functionally or manage your organization geographically. And of course, the right answer is probably some combination of the two. So you have to be thoughtful about how you run a matrixed organization. You don't want to have too many dotted lines and so forth. So I do spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, but at the same time, and, and I guess more generally, um, we want to make sure we're being thoughtful about stepping on the gas in countries where, we, where we're ready to step on the gas, where we're seeing an inflection point, and maybe we hadn't thought six months ago, you know, it's, we don't need to invest there yet, it's not time. Once you see the inflection point, you know, you have to jump on the opportunity. So we're trying to be, we're trying to make sure we're nimble globally about not getting too caught up in our preconceived plans about where we're going to open an office next, for example, um, while having obviously a spending framework for what we want to do and then making sure we can adapt to change. So, you know, thinking about Twitter, it's really interesting observation that while, you know, other major companies do have formidable competition in some places, um, even Facebook has, uh, uh, you know, in early days, uh, uh, competition, uh, MySpace, and then uh, Orkut in some countries like Brazil and India. Um, Russia is Kontakte. Um, obviously, China is a, is a separate case. But uh, it looks like Twitter have significantly less competition uh, globally. Uh, can you explain that? People are afraid of me as a powerful <laughs> leader and don't want to compete in this, any space that I'm in. Um, 
that not being the answer, I'll now answer the question. Um, so there have been a number of companies that have uh, tried to create direct competitors to Twitter. Um, um, and some of them still exist and, and some of them don't. Um, a, a, a significant number of them um, over the past few years. Um, when I think about competition, the way we think about it is, um, I guess along, along a spe very specific axis and it's along the, the, the platform axis and I'll talk about what I mean by that. Um, I, actually, I'll give a specific example. When eBay was kind of the king of auctions in, in the early days or the late years of the 90s, 96, 97, if you'll remember, Amazon and Yahoo decided, well, we're going to create auctions and we've got all these other powerful capabilities to bring to bear, so we're going to create auctions and we'll be able to beat eBay at their own game because we've got all these other powerful capabilities. And, you know, there were many a pundit in 90, 97, 98 when Amazon and Yahoo created auctions that thought, well, that's it for eBay. You know, Amazon will now be the king of auctions. And as we all know, uh, Amazon auctions went away shortly thereafter. Um, but Amazon then went about building a real platform for merchants, um, a distribution platform, a logistics platform, a recommendation engine. And today, it would be hard to argue with Amazon's, I don't know what the market is, but it's obviously well, I'm guessing well in advance of a $100 billion company. Um, it would be hard to argue that Amazon's was right about the most effective way to compete with these other companies isn't to create a like product, but to create a platform that better enables merchants to, uh, uh, to distribute uh, and, and provide a recommendation for engine for their goods. Um, so having said that, um, the way we think about competition is in the area of platforms and who will be the platform that provides a underlying fabric for communications, which is what we want to be. We want to be the fabric for all digital communications. Um, what's the platform that will really best enable that and, and allow other companies to best leverage that? Um, those will be the companies that we have to worry about competing against us. Is there anything special uh, that you think has to be in the culture of, uh, of Twitter to, uh, to enable uh, that to happen? For, for sure. Um, I'll say a couple things about the company's culture. I've said one of these before. Um, the first thing that I'll say is that everybody in the company has an amazing passion for the company. And um, we're the, we like to say, we're, our, our general counsel likes to say, we're the free speech wing of the free speech party. So that has profound implications for the way we think about protecting users' rights and users' rights to information. And it will, it leads us to do things like spend money out of our own pocket to make sure we can protect users' rights and rights to information. So we did that in the WikiLeaks case where we were asked to hand over information about users and we fought on our own dime to uh, be allowed to let the users know that their information was being requested so that they could fight that request. And, and we were successful in, in, that, in, in, in getting that information to those users. Um, so that kind of thinking about the company, and we have a, a, a very specific set of core values in the company that lots of people have uh, st stickers for on their laptops and everyone's internalized, cause you to think about it, the, the benefit to having a culture that's internalized across the company is it allows you to make decisions as a company and across teams in a very consistent way because you can look back to the core values and say, well, one of our values is X, so that should help us inform this decision, irrespective of the fact that you're in engineering and I'm in finance. Um, and um, just uh, would be great to pick up your brain on uh, the uh, uh, front of everybody. What, what do you think are the key trends for the next 10 years? It may actually help us a bit in kind of picking winners. I think the key trends for the next 10 years are this continued um, flood of information into, into the network. Um, well, if you just expand on what I said earlier about um, ripping down these artificial barriers, um, you, know, you just said there's more information published digitally in a day now than was published in, you know, um, 
it, 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 you know, it, you start to be able to make these crazy statements, right? Like in the, in the hundred years leading up to X, right. we created this much data and we created that much data yesterday. And that will just, those statements will be able to get crazier and crazier. As that happens, the amazing societal impact is that everybody has a voice. You know, so it used to be the case that people would say to me, and when I say used to be, this is maybe two years ago, three years ago, well, why would I use Twitter? I don't really have, you know, I don't, why do people care that I'm doing X? But it's more and more the case now that people realize a simple photo of a moment uh, is a contribution to the larger story of the day. And when I say we want Twitter to be the world in your pocket and you can pull it out and see what's going on in your world and the world, and I said those things thread together, as everybody starts to realize that my simple contribution to this is gonna paint the story of the day, there are just profound you know, technological, uh, societal, and educational uh, implications for that. I'll, as one example, um, you can imagine being someone researching heart disease as you think about more and more information, moment to moment, pouring into the network and what you, having wearable media that's constantly publishing to the cloud. You can imagine medical researchers starting to be able to gather much more information about a particular disease from a variety of subjects around the world that are publishing to them on an instantaneous basis. So I think that these small stories we see in Twitter um, are just going to play out on a larger scale across the world, probably faster than 10 years from now. Uh, you've mentioned uh, Twitter being a platform, and um, we know that there are not too many platforms around, and it's be becoming more and more concentrated. And uh, assuming that there are a few aspiring entrepreneurs in, in the audience, would it be a fair thing to say that their life will be more difficult because they will be dependent on these uh, big platforms? Uh, as never before, or it enables uh, something else? No, I think that some, as some platforms rise, other platforms fall by the wayside, and the new platforms hopefully are successful because they man they've enabled entrepreneurs to be more successful more quickly. Um, so in the case of Twitter specifically, when we started out, we really had an API, not a platform. And what the distinction I'll make is that the API enabled people to take tweets and go create another Twitter client, and that's great, and now there are thousands of Twitter clients, and, and we have owned and operated clients on all the platforms. But it didn't allow companies to really build a different kind of business leveraging our platform. We've got this amazing, you know, follower graph and these very specific um, primitive verbs, you know, retweet, uh, follow, uh, et cetera. And what I'd like to do is allow entrepreneurs to build their networks quickly on Twitter. Um, Instagram is a, and Foursquare you could say are early versions of that. Um, Instagram was able to leverage our follower graph and uh, build their user base quite quickly. I would like the platform to grow and expand in a way that allows companies to leverage that uh, even, more even more dramatically and grow their businesses more quickly. And making a little bit of a full, full, circle, full circle here, you know, being a CEO of Twitter, is it more like computer science or an art? It's, it's both, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I'll tell you what I think about being a leader of a company and, and, and the analytical side of the, you know, the right brain and the left brain. One of the things that's, that's funny about, about improv comedy and, and, and comedy specifically is people always say, well, because you did improv comedy, you must be able to adapt to change really quickly and be flexible and be nimble and that must help you as a business person or you know, be able to react to questions you didn't know you were gonna get on stage. Um, and, that, and that's true a little bit, but one of the first rules of, of improvisational theater, um, and, and not only one of the first rules, but one of the things that keeps being drummed into you as you perform, is the really great improvisers listen really well. They listen to what's being said instead of coming, into a, coming out on stage with a preconceived notion of what they're gonna say. And by listening to what's happening on stage, they're able to react better and, and, and be more clever, et cetera. 
And one of the things I try to tell all my managers at Twitter is, you can't communicate if you don't listen. And in between communicating and listening is deciding. So if you're not listening, deciding, and communicating, you're not going to be a good manager, and you're not going to be a good leader. So I think the thing that I learned from, from the art part of my life uh, was that, hey, you're not going to be successful if you don't listen, irrespective of how good you think your initial idea is when you walk out on that stage. Um, and that's something I try to impart to my managers. Thank you very much. Thank you.